we're going to move on to the uh, last presentation in this panel by Paul Kaufmann, who will be talking about Kukai as philosopher. Okay, so let's just start. Um, currently, I'm writing a book uh, that puts together my thoughts on Kukai that I gathered within the last years. Uh, in the first chapter of this book, I justify why I think it worthwhile to adopt a philosophical perspective on Kukai. And in today's talk, I will, then, uh, I will present these considerations and arguments. So my central concern here and now is whether we can understand Kukai as a philosopher. The American philosopher David Lewis has coined a phrase about philosophers that I believe most of us will find agreeable. He said, it is the profession of philosophers to question platitudes that others accept without thinking twice. So, in making this statement, Lewis was thinking of his teacher, Willard von Orm Quine. I believe, however, that it also fits quite well to the 9th century Buddhist thinker, Kukai. And here you see a statue of Kukai at Koyasan, but interestingly, he also looks a little bit like Quine here. So Kukai is considered the founder of esoteric Buddhism, and this in itself bring in a new religion, bring in a new school of Buddhism um, to Japan, uh, is connected with implementing new de doctrines, uh, arguing for the fourth or for the truth of new texts. And this in itself is already kind of um, arguing against the orthodoxy in a way. But more importantly, in his writings, he defends various unconventional views and consciously deviates from the intellectual mainstream of his day. His text, Sokushin Jōbutsugi, for example, starts with a self-critical question how he, that is Kukai, can assume that it is possible to awaken within this very body or within this life when the Buddhist sutras and treatises agree that it takes three eons to do so. In an earlier work, Kuka explains that all other schools in Japan agree that the awakened experience of the Buddha cannot be verbally expressed, and that only his own school denies this common assumption. And for that, he uses the term Hoshin Seppo that you see here. And this critical attitude toward, towards orthodox views, or platitudes, as Lewis put it, might be one of the reasons why Kukai has indeed often been called a philosopher. The plausibility of using the label philosopher with regard to Kukai depends, of course, on the conception of philosophy that we have in mind, consciously or unconsciously. Lewis' characterization of the philosopher as someone who thinks twice is often part of more elaborate and demanding conceptions of philosophy. One such conception is neatly expressed by Rodin's famous sculpture, Le Penseur. Among others, Lewis's teacher in Oxford, Gilbert Ryle, has given an account of what the person depicted in Rodin's sculpture is actually doing. And you find what he said about that in this long quotation that I'm going to read to you. In this respect, Le Penseur, if he merits our respect, is unlike the composing electioneer and like the composing lecturer. He does not to want to pull wool over his own eyes, but to pull the wool from his own eyes. He wants to acquire what the lecturer wants to help his students to acquire, a grasp or mastery of something that is not yet within reach, as what the will-be lecturer is here and now saying to himself is mooted and examined for his possible future educative effectiveness, so what Le Penseur is here and now saying to himself is mooted and examined for its chance of being a contribution to his own conquest of his own problem. But there remains this huge difference between the teacher and le penseur that the teacher has already mastered what he wants his students to master. He can guide them because he is on his own ground, but le penseur is on ground unexplored by himself and perhaps unexplored by anybody. He cannot guide himself through his jungle. He has to find his way without guidance from anyone who already knows. As Ryle's reference to our respect makes clear, he's presenting a normative account of the thinker's activity. 
Ryle is not explicitly talking about philosophy, but the value that he attaches to the described activity is the same that many people would ascribe to philosophy. It is valuable for being a free way of thinking off the beaten tracks and without any external guidance. Ryle's interpretation of that thinker thus comprises Lewis's idea of a philosopher as someone who uh, questions common sense opinions, but the picture implies more than that. The thinker is sitting alone on a rock, and Ryle understands this to imply that he is involved neither in teaching nor in politics. He's pursuing his philosophical problems independently from any social role, and he's not relying on earlier teachers or traditions. His objective is, furthermore, a purely theoretical one. He's trying to find his way through the jungle of his thought. He's not thinking about practical applications or engaged in any sort of visible outward behavior. The supposed independence of philosophers from social roles, traditions, and practical concerns has also been interpreted in the 20th century as marking a clear boundary between philosophy and religion. Whereas a religious thinker, according to this image, is trapped in his dependence on religious institutions, doctrinal authority, and traditional practices, the philosopher is freed from all these fetters. According to this image, a philosopher is thus mainly engaged in theoretical speculation and he pursues his questions without regard to any given set of traditionally valued doctrines. If we approach Kukai with this image in mind, calling him a philosopher loses all its incidental plausibility. Kukai sees himself primarily as an heir to the esoteric Buddhist tradition. This current within Buddhism promotes complex rites comprising mantra recitation and visualizations. Its sacred texts, the tantras and its commentaries, describe and promote these rites. And in general, esoteric texts do not make much use of the argumentative style of older Buddhist schools such as Abhidharma or Yogacara. Finally, as a prominent figure of early Heian in Japan, Kukai was much occupied with promoting specific rituals and securing financial and political support for his new school. All these features do not really fit well with the modern image of a philosopher depicted above. So, if we embrace this specific image and use it as a criterion to distinguish between philosophy and non-philosophy, we will have to conclude that Kukai was not a philosopher after all. But Kukai is only one example of an Asian and Buddhist thinker who turns out to be rather cumbersome when one tries to find a place for him in the modern system of disciplines. There are intense debates on the question whether there is any philosophy at all outside of the Western tradition. Many of these debates revolve around the problem of the relation between philosophy and religion and ask, for example, whether the term philosophy is applicable to Buddhist authors. It has not been noted very often, however, that similar discussions are led within the Western tradition. Many historians of Western philosophy have stressed that a clear-cut distinction between philosophy and religion is difficult to maintain with regard to most pre-modern authors. This seems to be particularly true with regard to the writers of the Middle Ages. Many of these thinkers lived in monasteries, promoted specific religious practices, and attributed unquestionable authority to the Bible and its commentaries. The difficulty of assessing the philosophical character of Buddhism in general and of Kukai's thought in particular has thus much in common with the problem of localizing medieval thought within the history of Western philosophy. Therefore, I would like to point to four prototypical reactions of Western philosophers to the religious character of medieval thought and evaluate these strategies with regard to their applicability to the Buddhist thought of Kukai. I think we can distinguish four such strategies that have been or are employed by modern philosophers to deal with the religious character of medieval thought. The first group says that uh, medieval philosophy is not real philosophy. The second group says that it's some kind of mixed philosophy. Uh, the third group um, refers to the self-understanding of medieval writers. And the fourth group 
proposes a broader definition. And as you will see, I find the last um, attempt most promising for also um, an approach to Buddhism. But let us go through these four steps one by one. So what about the not real philosophy uh, approach to medieval philosophy? Some modern philosophers have concluded from the religious character of medieval European thought that it was not philosophy in the strict sense. The early German historian of philosophy, Johann Jakob Brucker, for example, claimed that medieval thought is only a pseudo-philosophia. Hegel and other Enlightenment thinkers followed Brucker's verdict, and even Heidegger argued that the perfectly free questioning of human beings that is constitutive of philosophy was not possible in the Middle Ages. It is interesting to notice that many of the authors who deny the existence of philosophy in the European Middle Ages also deny the existence of philosophy in China. Hegel famously argued that China is a culture of stasis and therefore remains on a pre-philosophical stage. Heidegger equally denied the existence of Chinese philosophy. However, contemporary historians of Western philosophy have presented many arguments against the exclusion of medieval thought from the history of philosophy. One such reason is that the exclusion often rests on a monolithic understanding of periods and cultures. The Middle Ages are typically characterized as a Christian age and its thought is said to be dominated by Christian doctrines. This characterization downplays, however, the role that Muslim and Jewish authors played in this period. And even within the Christian world, a great variety of doctrines and interpretations can be found. This argument works equally well against the rejection of Asian philosophy. Those who deny the existence of philosophy in Asia also usually presuppose a homogeneous Asian culture. And this is certainly an untenable simplification and the philosophical character of an entire culture, it seems, would have to be tested for individual texts, authors, and discourses. So let's go to the second group. A second group of modern philosophers have thus chosen another strategy and have argued that there are genuine philosophical elements in medieval thought but that they have to be separated from their religious embedding. We can again quote Johann Jakob Brucker, who has claimed that we have to look for the gold nuggets within the dunghill of medieval thought. Van Steenbergen has a somewhat ambiguous relation to that operation and says that extraire le contenu philosophique est une opération artificielle et délicate, mais la chose est inévitable. Some modern philosophers, uh, some modern interpreters of Kukai have chosen a similar strategy in search of so-called philosophemes, that is, philosophical propositions or arguments. They ignore or judge as irrelevant all statements that are considered religious or even superstitious from a modern standpoint. This approach does not do justice to the authors it is dealing with, however. If we really want to understand what earlier authors meant to say, we should not try to separate ideas and topics that were intimately connected for the authors themselves. Otherwise, we basically presuppose that what the dead have to say to us is much the same as what the living have to say to us, as Bernard Williams put it. Departing from the idea that we have to take the self-understanding of our author seriously, a third position criticizes the attempt to separate philosophical from religious elements in medieval thought with the argument that we are thereby imposing our own understanding of philosophy. Medieval authors have their own conceptions of philosophy and have also reflected upon the relationship between philosophy and theology. Various ways to understand these disciplines have been proposed and are much more varied than modern commentators usually suppose. We should therefore refer to these conceptions when we talk about medieval philosophy. With regard to Kukai, this approach implies that we should refrain from the category of philosophy altogether as Kukai and his contemporaries in China and Japan did not have a concept of philosophy. 
Many Chinese intellectuals and Western Sinologists indeed shun away from the term philosophy because it is not a genuine term and it seems to impose a Western category. Now, this approach contains, I believe, an important lesson. We can only claim to be interested in any author's thought if we take into account how this author thought about himself and his intellectual activity. I thus certainly agree that we should take into account what medieval authors have said about philosophy and how Buddhist writers themselves described what they were doing in their texts. It seems to me, however, that reference to such self-conceptions does not fully solve the problem of how to characterize medieval and Buddhist thought. We still want to know if the authors in question also do philosophy in our sense and how our philosophy is related to theirs. What we need is thus a broader conception of philosophy that comprises both modern and classical ideas of philosophy. A more promising approach is to understand philosophy as a manière de vivre, that is, as an art of living, as Pierre Hadot has emphasized. He has shown that a great part of Western philosophy, from Socrates via the Middle Ages until today, is not a purely theoretical endeavor. Philosophy often involved spiritual exercises, and its theoretical investigations were often subordinate to the goal of spiritual liberation. Ador's conception thus denies a strict separability of philosophy and religion and thereby seems much more applicable to non-Western thought. Accordingly, John Adon Ganeri has argued for its applicability to classical Indian thought. Matthew Kapstein has shown its aptness to describe Buddhist authors and John Meraldo has already shown that the concept is useful in understanding the work of Kukai. One important element of this understanding is that philosophy is understood as a human activity, just like music, dance, or ritual. Everybody does philosophy to some degree. With the regard to medieval philosophy, Kurt Flasch also refers to this understanding of philosophy. He characterizes human beings in a general way as beings that struggle to find orientation in life by reflecting on it and then understands philosophy as an attempt to provide health, help within this struggle. Not any form of life that involves spiritual exercises and self-reflection is philosophy, however. Philosophy becomes significant in particular, I believe, when human beings are confronted with contradictions. When reflecting on our lives, we will regularly detect groups of statements, each of which we would like to endorse, but which taken together seem to contradict each other. Sometimes such contradictions cannot simply be, be, re, be removed by observation or by gathering further information, but make it necessary to weigh reasons and reconsider our understanding of the concepts involved. In these cases, we might speak with Aristotle of dialectical problems, and we can understand philosophy in accordance with this old tradition as an attempt to solve such dialectical problems. As dialectical problems often contain endoxa, that is, opinions accepted by most people, this characterization of philosophy also captures Lewis's idea of the philosopher as a critic of platitudes. But it does not presuppose, as the modern image of philosophy does, that this critique must be free from any religious or ideological commitment, nor does it imply a fixed argumentative style. This conception of philosophy also um, fits to Kukai and other Buddhist authors. Many Buddhist thinkers have been understood as trying to solve dialectical problems, and Kukai would describe his own activity in a way that is similar to my characterization of philosophy. He tells us, for example, that he is fond of resolving systematic contradictions. One such contradiction is mentioned in a famous passage of his text, Shorai Mokuroku. There it says, the teaching originally has no words, but if it is not words, it does not manifest. True thusness is beyond visual form, but depending on visual form, we awaken. Now, this short passage expresses a central problem for all Buddhist thinkers, the problem of the transmission of the Dharma. 
It belongs to the common ground of all Buddhists that in his awakening experience, the Buddha recognized the truth and afterwards transmitted this truth to other sentient beings. The Buddha found out that our lives are full of suffering because we are trapped in the cycle of rebirths. The reason for our being reborn again and again is that we cling to objects that do not really exist or that are very different from what we normally suppose. Our false ways of thinking and seeing the world only trick us into believing in their existence and attractiveness. The transmission problem hinges on the fact that the signs that the Buddha could use for communicating this discovery are deeply entangled with our illusory cognitions. False ways of thinking generate misleading expressions and misleading expressions in turn generate false ways of thinking. It therefore seems that as long as we are stuck within the normal illusory mode of thinking, we cannot be let off out of it by linguistic or other communicative means. So how can the Buddha transmit his truth? So this is the problem that I call the uh, problem of the transmission of the Dharma. And we can analyze this problem as a dialectical problem in the Aristotelian sense, I believe, that is as expressing statements that one wants to endorse, but that seem to contradict each other. So you have the three statements. The Buddha can transmit the truth that he recognized. Truth can only be transmitted through science, but signs are misleading. So what can we do out of this? Unfortunately, I cannot tell you what Kukai's solution to this problem is, but I hope to do so on next year's InnoJP conference. <laughs> But for today, I would like to summarize that I think I have shown that Kuka is indeed trying to solve dialectical problems. And proceeding from the idea that solving dialectical problems is a philosophical activity, often integrated into a particular way of life, I think we have good reason to conclude that Kuka was indeed a philosopher. And I think this result is interesting for all research on Kukai, and it also justifies my own approach to the work. But more importantly, I think it also gives us a tool to talk about other Asian thinkers and, as philosophers, and it might also challenge some of our modern conceptions of philosophy. Thank you very much. I have a question about the strategy for this opening chapter that you've done. Um, one of the reasons for asking where to place him in intellectual history, or where could we place him comfortably as a philosopher, is so that we know what kind of critical questions we can ask him. But then also, the, through comparison, we can ask if there's anything missing from his cosmo vision, from his vision of the world. Now, these two things are one of the reasons for placing. It isn't just out of curiosity, right? I mean, you have a you have an agenda, and that's what I don't understand. Um, I I just find choosing medieval um, philosophy, theology, or scholastic thought, I find that a strange um, touchstone for placing him. I mean, you have Protagoras, you have Plato, you have um, the Stoics, you have Plotinus, all of whom would have brought all these things together. And if you just stick to the Middle Ages, you have the Hermetic and the pseudo-Hermetic tradition, you have the alchemical, you have the mystical tradition, all of which gives us literature that's very close in style to the kinds of things he was doing. Um, but that's, that's a strategical question. My question about what kind of philosophical critique could we bring to him, and what has he contributed to cosmovision? My own bias, and I don't know anything near as much as Kukai about what you do, but my own initial bias would be, first of all, that the absence of the ethical, of the moral dimension, of almost the Buddhist compassion in um, Kukai's thought is um, something we want to look at the philosophical roots for. The Sokshin Jobuts, who already from the ninth century was mm -hmm. criticized by the hostel school, and Tokuitsu and all those people, uh, precisely because it didn't care about the world. It was interested in private enlightenment. So um, whether that's correct or not, I don't know. But I would, you know, I think that's um, something we look into. As for the second question, what he could contribute, I don't know anybody in Japanese philosophy aside from him who took sound as a primary metaphor for awakening, for seeing the world as it is, as opposed to sight. Everything is 
seeing. I mean, enlightenment is all interpreted in terms of seeing things. Um, even though the character for sight is rarely used in, in <coughs> Japanese terms, still, it's all sight. And Kuka had this thing about talking to the mountains and the mountains talking back and about the primacy of sound. And I mean, the only place we find a long tradition of that that I know of is in India. We don't have anything like that in Japan, really. And um, I think that's, well, those are just my two suspicions of, of what kind of contribution I think he could make and what sort of criticism um, I'd make against him. So the first comments were just a side. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know well see if I can distill some question out of your very helpful remarks. Um, I mean, as I understood you, you would like to know better why, if my approach or if my reason for calling him a philosopher yes. is that then we can criticize him yes. and we can look for parts that are yes. missing, where would I see these things? Where would I see what is missing and where would I? I, I just assume that's why you would try to place him. I'm just a little surprised at how you, what you took as your model of the kind of philosopher you're comparing with. And, um, that was all. That's just... It wouldn't, my first thought wouldn't be about the scholastics at all, especially since Thomas's best philosophy was written in his theology books. Yeah. His philosophy is uninteresting. You know? I mean, it's all such a mess there. Oh, and, and also, praxis wasn't important for them. That's why you have this all these Thomistic uh, educated people, even beginning with Albert the Great, who became alchemists or mystics. You know? So I, I, that just seems... Like, but that's not the real question. What do you think his main contribution to philosophy is, and why, why introduce Kuka as a philosopher, and what sort of critical questions do you think? I just gave examples of yeah, yeah. where my mind went, but you know much more about this. Um, because I think he has something to say about language, about truth and meaning. Okay. And I think this has to do with, um, or what I would like to argue for is that, I mean, what he does with this three statements is give them a new interpretation. Um, I think with regard to the first statement that the Buddha can transmit the truth that he recognized is a reinterpretation of the term Buddha because he's then talking about the Dharmakaya, that's the Hoshin Seppo uh, part. Uh, and also what is Seppo, what, is, um, what does it mean to preach? And then he would say it is not <coughs> like uh, what he himself is doing, standing there and giving a talk about some, some sutra, but it's cosmic activities. It's, it's uh, the whole development of, of the cosmos is, um, it's, it's difficult to find a good metaphor here, but it's, um, it's all actions of the Buddha, let's put it that way. And I think, uh, here and here, we have the question, what is a sign? So what is a meaningful entity? Um, and I think he gives an interesting um, conception of this with some similarity to Saussure. I think you have some, some elements there that you have um, a pattern of sounds that somehow corresponds to other patterns. And you have a whole range of um, relations between such patterns and not only acoustic but also visual I mean I, I somehow uh, or he, he you say that he's also talking about visual form actually so um, this also interests him very much and these these relations and I think so he has to offer um, yeah, a new or an interesting conception of meaning meaning being something like uh, changing somebody's mind and here, I think he has something to say what it is to be misleading. And uh, with regard to the last statement, I think being misleading for him is, means being only part of the truth. But there is no false statements per se, but it's only partial statements. And I think this gives a int very interesting picture about um, truth and meaning. And this is why I think that he in a way contributes not to solve 
modern philosophical problems, but uh, because he contributes on, on the human discourse about language, just as Dunskotos has done, for example, or Eriugina or something. We're running out of time, but we have a lot of time, don't we? We, do. we have a lot of time, <laughs> because there's no final answer there. Well, okay, there's a coffee break after this. <laughs> My question will be very short, because I think I'm just rephrasing the same questions, but in a negative way. <laughs> saying and asking, but in a more straight way. Because you talk in a very, very positive way uh, of the possibility we can have. But then I would like to ask, what would we miss if you don't do that job? Like, what would you like? What would we miss as in not calling him as a philosopher? Uh, uh, I think in the case of Kuka, it's actually not happening that often. But I think what you see with regard to um, a lot of other Buddhist thinkers is that. Nowadays, they are reduced to being, um, they only brought up certain uh, ideas because they wanted to find a place for them within the um, political landscape. They wanted to get more money from the emperor. They wanted to um, establish a new monastery here and there. I think there is a danger of seeing figures like Kuka only as religious entrepreneurs or political agents and that we miss that they were really trying to solve philosophical problems. Uh, one last yes. question. One last question. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, We're running I'd like to ask about your conception of field philosophy you introduced in beginning of your talk. This is not uncontroversial, right? So your view so. or your conception of philosophy struck me rather analytical, so armchair philosophy, right? We are thinking of problems. But there is another tradition in philosophy, the Hermi the Hermeneutic tradition, so to speak. And there the problem is not so much we are thinking about entities, but we are thinking how we come to see certain entities as we are doing now. So it is a historical project, so to speak, to, re <coughs> to retrieve, so, so to speak, um, if we are studying Philosophers of the past, I think it was Collingwood which who coined this. Uh, we are we have to find out what was the question they tried to give an answer for, right? And this hermeneutical consciousness is uh, continuously absent. And I understand your strategy because in order to label Kukai as a philosopher. You seem to think that this is the most uh, promising way to offer a conception of philosophy that is not the individual tradition, but in the other tradition. But, uh, well, it's a decision. It is not resolving the problem of how we should think about philosophy. So I just want to say, be prepared for criticism from the community <laughs> side. So I'm not asking you to change your project, but uh, and I'm really lo looking forward to the, uh, to the outcome of this. But I just wanted to say, be prepared. There might be some uh, harsh criticism from the community side. Yeah. Uh, very, very quick. Yes or no? <laughs> Uh, first of all, thanks a lot. Uh, second, I think uh, I would describe my own philosophical project differently from what I think is Kuka's philosophical project. And I would describe my philosophical project a lot more along hermeneutical lines. Okay. 
because I mean, what I want to do is to understand Kukai from the questions that he tries to answer. But I don't think that Kukai did this. I don't see him as a um, with much historical consciousness. I think Plato also was not doing this thing, and you can ask what is the question you try to even answer. So that's right. Not a problem at all. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.